is like Luke is just going to press in on this. And all I want to say is that what we'll see today is that the need for the cross is for everybody, including disciples, including disciples, that uh, we who consider ourselves, which most, if not all of us in this room, consider ourselves followers of Jesus, um, we still need Jesus. Um, we needed him. We need him. We will need him. He is the source of our life, as I think you'll see today. So as we prepare our hearts, um, and remember Jesus said he came for the sick. He came to give spiritual sight to the blind. Um, he is the great physician. In light of today's message, I thought it would be good to, before we sing, to read from Psalm 51. This is the famous psalm that David prayed. And David was one who described as a disciple in a way. He was a man after God's own heart, a man who followed after God's own heart. Here's someone that we look at as, you know, an example or whatever, but he too needed the grace of God because he stumbled and fell many times in his life. And this is what he prayed on one of those occasions when he really fell um, in a pretty bad way. Psalm 51. Have mercy on me, O God, because of your unfailing love, because of your great compassion. Blot out the stain of my sins. Wash me clean from my guilt. Purify me from my sin. For I recognize my shameful deeds. They haunt me day and night. Against you and you alone have I sinned. I have done what is evil in your sight. You will be proved right in what you say, and your judgment against me is just. For I was born a sinner. Yes, from the moment of, that my mother conceived me, but you desire honesty from the heart, so you can teach me to be wise in my inmost being. Purify me from my sins, and I will be clean. Wash me, and I will be whiter than snow. Oh, give me back my joy again. You have broken me. Now let me rejoice. Don't keep looking at my sins. Remove the stain of my guilt. Create in me a clean heart, O God. Renew a right spirit within me. Do not banish me from your presence and don't take your Holy Spirit from me. Restore to me again the joy of your salvation and make me willing to obey you. Unseal my lips, O Lord, that I may praise you. You would not be pleased with sacrifices or I would bring them. If I brought you a burnt offering, you wouldn't accept it. The sacrifice you want is a broken spirit, a broken and repentant heart, O God, you will not despise. Let's pray and then sing together. Heavenly Father, thank you so much that we can gather together this morning. Lord, we are broken people who live in a broken world. We thank you, Jesus, that you came for us, for rescue, for the forgiveness of our sins, but to make us new, to renew us, to conform us again into the image that you first created us to be. But Lord, this is a journey we're on, and we stumble and we fall, but we thank you that your mercies are new every morning, and great is your faithfulness. And so we come before you this morning. God, put praise on our lips, gladness in our hearts. We are your disciples, and yet we've got a long way to go, and yet you accept us. Thank you for that. We praise you in Jesus' name. Amen. stand as we worship this morning. To the cross I look And to the cross I cling Of its suffering I do drink Of its work I do sing On it my Savior both bruised and crushed show that God is love and God 
God is just. What a priceless gift, undeserved life, have I been given through Christ crucified. You call me out of death, you call me into life, I was under your now through the cross I'm reconciled. At the cross you beckon me, you draw me gently to my knees and I am lost for words so lost in love I sweetly broken holy surrendered at the cross you
places of our hearts, the deep ones that we're not proud of, the hidden ones, God, we invite you into every place. Come and heal us, restore us, fill us with yourself. I just want to thank you for your presence this morning. Amen. And thanks, Jenna. Proud of you. <laughs> Morning, church family. I love all y'all. Is that how you say it, Marcia? All y'all? I'm, I'm a Californian, so I tend to say dude, and what, and awesome, so um, I know from a lot of conversations with all y'all <laughs> that it's been a really tough season. <laughs> it's been a, a season where we have been emotionally and mentally taxed to the max. You know, uh, 10 million people in the United States have resigned their jobs due to burnout in the past year. Uh, so much stress around us. Two weeks ago, I hit, I hit rock bottom. <laughs> I hit my burnout point. It had been a couple weeks in the building, maybe actually a couple years in the building. Um, but I hit the point of like feeling just like, I'm done. My body, my mind cannot take any more. You know, it is, it's extremely complicated when one tries to sort out what's going on inside their mind. Um, but I, I just hit my wall, completely exhausted, totally depleted, nothing left to give, feeling like I didn't have any life to pour into others, my tank completely empty, um, feeling like I just need to take care of me. <laughs> and uh, many of you are aware that the trauma that was experienced working at a previous church, um, there's a lot of hurt laid on pastors that resigned, and a lot of that hurt is still ongoing. Um, there are a lot of triggers 
and I'm still very wounded, and there's still interactions uh, with some of those people around town, and it just seems like there's daily a reminder of that hurt and the pain, and I'm still, I think, as angry as I was three years ago. Also, I'm struggling in my attempts, in my role as a lead pastor here at North State, co-lead pastor. Dave and LaShawn are gold to work with. I love them. They've given me so much grace as I've tried to process my wounds and my, my healing uh, with them. My wife has been a tremendous support to me as well. Um, you know, figuring things out one day at a time. Just make it till tomorrow. Um, so it's, it's been hard for me, I think, to transition from the American church, the evangelical American church mindset, which in my opinion is this self-feeding corporate monster, to that of family community, where we choose to do life together and live this level of intimacy and vulnerability and openness one-on-one uh, -on -one and one-on -on with God, you know, these one-on-one -on -one relationships. And I know many of us feel the birth pains of, of that. Um, it's been hard for me the way I'm wired. I'm, I, I was a performer with a stage. Ever since I was six years old, I was on a stage performing with music. And I grew up with... Uh, a lot of that is my identity. And I'm, I'm at the place in my life where I just need serious help. And I've been encouraged by our team and my family to pursue intensive counseling um, to help me deal with past church trauma and uh, the current anxiety that I'm uh, struggling with. Uh, so today, after our church gathering, Becky and I are hopping on a plane to Colorado where tomorrow morning I start my intensive with a professional who works with burnout pastors. And I wanted to share this with you all this morning as my church family, because we've never wanted to stand up here as pastors and then put on a front that we've got it all together. We've always desired uh, to show that we're broken people in process. And we've wanted our roles as pastors to be able to walk alongside you and your healing journeys. And now I'm finally honest enough to ask people to walk beside me in my healing journey. Um, so thank you, church family, for giving me the grace to pursue this. And I just would remind us that this journey towards becoming like Jesus was never supposed to happen alone. Um, this is why we exist, to provide that community, that support, so we can walk with each other. And if you're in a similar place today as me and you need, you need help, <laughs> talk to someone. Um, let us know. This is, this is why we're here. This is why we exist. This morning, Everett and I have the honor of sharing in uh, Luke chapter 22 and uh, chapter 23. And as we approach what we're going to look at with these uh, two characters of uh, Judas and Peter this morning, there's a, a serious danger in turning complex people into one-dimensional characters. So if I were to say, like, um, what are your first thoughts when I would ask you to describe uh, Robin Williams as a person? What would you say? What would you shout out? Funny. Funny. <laughs> Patch Adams. <laughs> Hook for me as Peter Pan. Say again. Dynamic. Dynamic. Yeah, what else? Sensitive. What? Sensitive. Sensitive. Okay, yeah, soft side. There you go. What else about Robin Williams? If you were to sum up his life or career in one word, what would it be? Tragic. Hmm? Tragic. Tragic. Yeah. I know um, the, the front that he put on as a comedian was, um, you know, we loved him for his humor and his wit, but when the story about his life and his childhood came out, it was tragic. Like he grew up in a, uh, a mansion and was by himself uh, all alone while his famous parents did their own thing. And he was so lonely, he would invent friends and he would uh, talk to them. And that became uh, part of his like struggling with, with loneliness. When he was in sixth grade, he was bullied to the point where he came home after school and he would cry and he would cry and he wanted to end his life. In high school, what was written in his yearbook 
was most likely not to succeed. Could you imagine dealing with that kind of pressure? So he puts on this front of, of comedy, wanting people to like him, not wanting to experience feelings of lonely. You see, when we see on the outside, this man's a comedian, this man is talented, this man is funny, but on the inside, he's broken, he is hurt. He's a complex character. What about Simone Biles from the Olympics? What do you think of when you hear her name? Strong? Strong? Yeah. Perseverance. Perseverance. What do you say, Robert? Courageous. Courageous. Yes, absolutely. So she was battling this caricature of her. She's an Olympian. She has to perform. And then the pressure gets to her, and she ends up sitting out and says, you know what, I've got to... I've got to take care of myself. And what was great was the support that I think America poured on her and saying, you know what, it's okay to not have it all together, to not have to be that gold medalist. It's okay to sit down and bow out and just let yourself heal, to deal with the anxiety and the pressure. When we read Bible stories, we tend to relegate many characters in terms of like a caricature, a one-dimensional caricature. He's a tax collector. She's a prostitute. He's a king. He's a centurion, a Roman. And we miss the complexity of them being human beings. Everyone in historical accounts can be related to and must be related to. We want to give an insight, Everett and I, into two people today. We want to explore their motivations, their depths, because in them, we find something that connects all of us together, in Judas and in Peter. So first, I'm going to read the account in Luke chapter 22. Uh, Jesus is in the Garden of Gethsemane. Within 24 hours, Jesus will be dead. And last week, Dave led us through Jesus' last supper with his disciples. He's been praying. He's been sweating blood. He's in agony and turmoil at the suffering that he's about to undergo. And we come to this scene. Verse 47. While he was still speaking, a crowd came up. And the man who was called Judas, one of the twelve, was leading them, and he approached Jesus to kiss him. But Jesus asked him, Judas, are you going to betray the Son of Man with a kiss? When Jesus' followers saw what was going to happen, they said, Lord, should we strike with our swords? And one of them struck the servant of the high priest, cutting off his right ear. But Jesus answered, No more of this. And he touched the man's ear and healed him. Then Jesus said to the chief priests, the officers of the temple guard, the elders who had come from him, Am I leading a rebellion that you've come at me with swords and clubs? Every day I was with you in the temple courts, and you did not lay a hand on me. But this is your hour when darkness reigns. I am Judas, one of the followers of Jesus, or as we called him, Yeshua. I was one of the twelve chosen to walk closest with him. When I started following Yeshua three years ago, I was amazed at his teaching. He had captured my heart. All this talk of kingdom revolution. What was not to love? He said he was bringing the kingdom of heaven. Imagine the Messiah in my day. He would overthrow the Romans. He would establish Jerusalem as the center of the world and set up a throne that would last for generations. But Yeshua didn't do things the way I thought he would. In order to have a government overthrown, there's certain things you have to do. You have to rally loyal supporters. You provide a vision for them, weapons. You have them trained. You get a standing with the local Pharisees and the leaders, and you pass the word along. But instead of raising up an army, he went around teaching on charity. He said, if someone strikes you, you turn to the other cheek. Instead of fighting the Romans, he healed their servants and talked with outsiders like Samaritans. I was friends with many Pharisees, and they knew best how revolution should happen in the tricky political climate in which we lived. If only they could talk 
to Yeshua. If only they could change his mind. But Yeshua kept avoiding them, saying his time hadn't come. He kept slipping away and working miracles on beggars and blind men. Well, he had to talk. He needed to talk to them to explain what he was all about. So I arranged a meeting. After the Passover meal, Yeshua told us he was going to pray among the olive trees in the garden. So I ran to the Pharisees and I told them where Jesus was going to be. They asked me to lead them to him. So I did. And they even gave me money to do it. They got a large number of soldiers with swords and spears and torches. This was very unnerving for me, having all these guards and leaders of the country following behind me. A few of the other disciples were in the garden when I led them right to where Jesus was. But they were sleeping among the trees. And the guards asked me, pointing, which one of these is your rabbi? And I told them, the one I kiss on the cheek is he. So I walked straight to Yeshua. Time slowed down. My mind felt conflicted. Wasn't this what I wanted? It? I wanted to arrange a meeting so Jesus could explain himself to them. And they could set him on the right path of what this revolution was supposed to be. Why did my heart feel so heavy? Why did I feel like darkness was at the door to my soul? This was better for the country. This was better for me. So I crossed the uneven soil to where he stood. I grabbed both of his shoulders and stood in front of him. And I said, Hail, Rabbi. I leaned forward to his side and I kissed his cheek. I heard the guards coming up behind me. I looked back at him. What he said next turned my blood to ice. These were the last words he spoke to me. Judas, you would betray me with a kiss? I stood there stunned. I watched in a daze as the soldiers tied him up and led him away. Peter tried to fight, but he was quickly subdued. For a while, I was unable to move. Then I followed at a distance. I was no longer the one leading the crowd. Now I was at the back of it. And as I walked behind them all, I felt my stomach tighten. I felt so rank and unholy. What was I doing? What, what had I done? Yeshua had done no wrong. I started running. But what could I do, though? I'd caught up to the crowd, and the word had spread through them that there was going to be a criminal trial. I knew how trials at night ended. I ran again and caught up with the re religious leaders as they started to enter into their palace, and I yelled at them, I've sinned. I've done something wrong. I've betrayed innocent blood. And they said to me, so? That's on you. Yes, it was on me. I wronged a man who did no wrong to me. My soul sank to the lowest place a soul can sink. I threw my blood money down onto the floor, and I ran out my guilt too strong to bear. <laughs> Judas did something that we think we could never do. I would have never done that to Jesus. Yet when we look at him closely, we think a lot like him. Is Jesus working in our country like we want him to today? If he's not, do we try to push our own agendas, saying, well, that's God's agenda? What if in those moments of trying to save our ideals, stand up for what we believe in, or rally a Facebook crowd to our cause, we're actually betraying Jesus in the process. What if we've chosen the path of conquer and dominion over humility and meekness and service? Perhaps in those moments we've betrayed Jesus. 
Perhaps there's a bit of Judas in us after all. But the story doesn't end there, Everett. I'm Peter. It was just a normal work day when I met him. My brothers and I were just on the shore cleaning our boats from the previous night. We usually fish at night. And as we were cleaning, a small crowd started coming towards us. But I didn't really think much of it. And then I noticed a single individual walking up to my boat. That's odd. And he sat in my boat and asked me to push him off the shore. It's like, who does he think he is? That's mine. But based on the crowd and the way he was walking about, I figured he was a local rabbi or a local teacher of some sort. So I figured I should just obey what he was asking me. So I did that, and I went back to working on cleaning the nets and other things that I usually bring with me on the boat. And as he came to a close, he spoke to me directly and said, let's go put the nets out on the water. I was so confused. If you know anything about fishing, it's that midday is the worst time of day to go out on the water. Plus, I just went last night. Why would I go again? But again, he was a rabbi and was speaking to me, so I should probably do what he was asking. And so I got in the boat with him, and we went out, and when we were in the middle of the water, I set the nets out. We sat there for a little. And then he told me to bring them in. And I tried to. But they were so full of fish that I couldn't lift it myself. I stood up in my boat and I yelled to shore for a second boat to come help. It took a while for us to bring all those fish into our boats. I was so puzzled and all I could do is just collapse in the middle of my boat at the feet of this teacher, just shaking my head. What is this? This must be a miracle. Why am I worthy to have been a witness to this? And the man looked down at me and he said, come follow me and I will make you a fisher of men. We got to shore and I pulled in my boat for the very last time. But after a couple of years, it was, it was great. And, and this year especially, I was really excited to have the Passover meal of Jesus. But he had a weird speech. He talked about how he was going to go suffer, that one of us would betray him, and that the end was near. The other disciples and I, we looked around at each other, around the table, just puzzled about what he was saying. And we also looked around at each other, just wondering in our heads, which of us was the betrayer, if any? And then he spoke to me and said, Peter, I've been praying for you. I've been praying that your faith would be strong, that it wouldn't fail you, and that when the time comes, you could encourage your brothers. It's like, Jesus, my faith is strong now. I'm ready now to serve you. I'm strong now. And he said, before morning, you will betray me and deny me three times. I just sat there in disbelief that he would say that to me after I've given up everything to follow him. And then we went to the grove. Jesus said he was going to go off to pray. And so the other disciples and I kind of sat in a spot and Jesus told us to be awake and we did our best, but it had been a long day, and it was exhausting, just all the confusion of what Jesus had told us over the meal. We must have dozed off because we woke to him saying, you can't even stay up with me. You guys should be praying too. And just as he was speaking, a large crowd led by our brother Judas appeared. Jesus was right that one of us would betray him. I should have known it would be Judas. After all, he did disappear after the meal. 
So the crowd surrounded us, was closing in on us, and I was getting nervous. And one of them got too close to Jesus, so I drew my sword, and I, I struck the man. He's getting way too close to Jesus. I had to defend Jesus. And then Jesus looks at me, says, put your sword away. Why was he disappointed in me? I was just trying to protect him. They were coming for him. They got too close. And then he let the crowd take him. Man. Just thought to myself, this isn't how the Messiah was supposed to rescue us. How he was supposed to establish his kingdom. He was supposed to fight those who oppressed us and who dominated us. But how could he lead that fight if he was just being taken away as a prisoner. And he went out away without a fight. He just did what they said. And it all just made me look like a fool. But I decided to follow the crowd. From a distance, I had my hood on and was in the shadows. And then they got to the temple and they lit a fire and a group formed around it. And, and then there's another group off to the side that's just watching over Jesus, making sure he didn't escape or something. So I figured maybe if I got close enough, I could you know, just keep an eye on Jesus. And so I worked my way into the crowd and you know, making sure I was spotted. And I actually found a place near the fire. It was a cold night. I took a seat and just, you know, looking between the gaps between people to see if I could find Jesus. And I found a couple spots, so I was doing that for a little. And then the girl who was on the other side of the fire for me, she was looking at me funny. I noticed that. And then she said, hey, you're with Jesus, aren't you? I said, no, no, I'm not. And everyone else in the crowd, they're looking at me, wondering, asking themselves that question, but... My response seemed to keep them calm for now. More time went on. And then another man started looking at me funny. It's like, oh, not again. He was like, you're a follower of him. I've seen you before. I said, no, I'm not. Stop. That must have caused a commotion. And a couple people kind of distanced themselves from me and even got up from the fire. But I went back to looking for, for Jesus, just checking in on him, looking through people, the gaps between heads. I could actually see better now that people had left. And after a while, I started looking into the fire, just reflecting on, on the meal, what Jesus had said, that one of us would betray him, that I would deny him. And then the garden scene. I was so disappointed and just confused. I thought I was doing the right thing. And after a while, a another person said, yeah, you're from Galilee, you follow Jesus. I was so fed up. I've had enough of these people. So I stood up and I looked at them and said, stop, I do not follow him, I'm not associated with him, just leave me alone. As I finished that word, I heard the rooster crowing. My heart hurt, my stomach sank, just standing there, just shock. Now the corner of my eye, I noticed Jesus was looking at me. Oh man. And I looked at him. And he gave me this look. And I was so confused. He wasn't angry at me. It was a look similar to that of, of the first moments that I had met him. Come follow me, he said. But now, even now, after I denied him three times, how could he? I just failed. 
and I couldn't stand to see him look at me. So I stood up and ran away, weeping and beating myself up. When Caleb first came to me with this idea, I was, I was pretty uncomfortable because I'd never done anything like this before. But I know that when, when I've spoken before, I, I tend to talk about these people that follow Jesus, these people that Jesus interacts with. And in our message meetings, it seems like Christina brings up that I say the word character a lot. And and it's the way I, I, maybe I just understand the Bible as, I, as a narrative, but that almost makes it a little bit less real. And so doing this, being challenged to do this, allowed me to not just see them as characters, but people. And, and I know Caleb and I, we're, we're not saying that this is exactly the posture. This is exactly what they're saying in their heads. We're, we're not trying to say that at all, but... We're begging the question of, if they're not characters, if they're people like us, what could they have been thinking? What was going through their minds at that time? And I think for me, it was really helpful to think in that light, to humanize them, not as just a character. Yes, they're a character in the Gospel of Luke, but they're a person who followed Jesus, just like me. And I wanted to start with the beginning of, of Peter's journey following Jesus. I believe that in most of the Gospels, he's the first or in the first grouping of people who Jesus invites to follow him. And there's excitement to that, that Peter is at the beginning of this movement that Jesus is starting. He's one of the 12, one of Jesus' closest friends. And as a fisherman being invited to come follow a rabbi, a teacher, that must have been like a level up for Peter. Some excitement to that. But also another aspect of including the beginning story is that Peter didn't know Jesus until Jesus came to him. So the unknowingness to knowingness, and then at the end of their time together, uh, after three years, you would think they have a good idea of who each other are. And I think that was there. But we also know that there was parts that Peter and Judas weren't quite gasp, gasping, grasping about who Jesus was. I think if I was Peter and, and Jesus told me that I'm praying for you, it's like, oh, thanks, Jesus, that your faith wouldn't fail. And that after trial, that you can encourage your brothers. I'd be like, wait a second. You said you're praying for me, but also you're saying that I'm going to fail? It's like, no, I'm not. Like, I, I've been following you. I've been dedicated to you. That would be really unsettling for me. And, and then the scene with the sword where Judas tries to protect Jesus. So much so that he attacks a man and, I mean, he bleeds. I don't know what type of aim Peter had. He only got the ear. Like, these swords were, like, three feet long and you only get an ear. I don't understand. But, yeah, that, that emotion in Peter to want to defend Jesus, to protect him. And then Jesus healing the man, reversing what Peter thought was the right thing to do. Just the amount of confusion that that would have brought. And, and I'm also not saying that Peter didn't understand who Jesus was, that there's all this unknowingness, we can never know. Peter could have never known who Jesus was. I think Peter had a, a great idea of who Jesus was. And we even know, like, after the resurrection, their, you know, their minds are open to the scriptures. But I know in my own relationship with Jesus, there are things that I know for certain about him. And then there's times when I struggle, like Peter struggles here, and the way Judas does too. And I think the denial is really interesting. In the three times, like it, it doesn't hit Peter the first time, 
that like, oh, like in my head, or even out loud that I just said, I don't know Jesus, you know? And, that, and that's why I brought out maybe the self-justification, trying to blend in, you know? He was just trying to keep an eye on Jesus. But three times. And all, all the Gospels share that Peter denies Jesus. But Luke is the only one that includes, it's in verse 61, 2261. It says, And the Lord turned and looked at Peter. And Peter remembered the saying of the Lord, how he had said to him, Before the rooster crows today, you will deny me three times. This look. And it doesn't say what the look is. It doesn't say, and Jesus looked ang angrily at Peter, or he doesn't say, he looked joyfully at Peter. And I was wrestling with that a lot, of like, what type of look would Jesus have given Peter? So I went to Google for help. <laughs> There's this website called the Gospel Coalition that um, pastors and different scholars will write different articles, and I, I found one really helpful in it talked about this look. So it's by a pastor named Thabiti Anabwali. And he says this, I think the look was pure and holy love, which we cannot bear to see in our sin, in our self-righteousness. We could understand, even want, desire, anger, disappointment, and hurt, or even, and I told you so. But when the Lord continues to look at us, with an unfeigned and unblemished love, it robs us of all self-righteousness and makes us to see what holy love we rejected and what wretched messes we are. We can't bear to see him look at us with such pure and holy love when we failed so miserably. So like Peter, we turn our faces away and we weep bitterly when we fail our Lord. I think the self-righteous part in that Throughout the gospel accounts, we see Peter, the person, have this self-righteousness in himself. And, and I can resonate with that. I beat myself up. I'm really hard on myself. And it's out of that own self-righteousness, the own disappointment in ourself, and maybe even in Peter's self, that he couldn't stand Jesus looking at him in a loving way. He wanted anger. He wanted wrath. He wanted Jesus to be disappointed. But Jesus could only offer a look of love. Even like Peter, yeah, you denied me three times, but I still love you. You're still my disciple. And I think it's harder to accept that than to have someone say, I'm disappointed in you because you already know you deserve that. But Jesus gives us this love that we don't deserve. And he goes to the cross when we don't deserve it. We can each identify with both these men. Peter is one who fears about how he's going to be perceived. He's got his reputation as a Christ follower to think about. I, I do that too. I am the one who denies. And Judas, who takes matters into his own hands to create a kingdom that he thinks should be instituted instead of waiting for Jesus to do it in his own time and his own way. I am also the betrayer. How many times a week do I betray Jesus and what he stood for? The reason these two men are so important in history is because they represent us. They are us. The broken, messed up, foot and mouth, advance their own agendas, us. We are thieves and sinners, lustful and angry. We're doubters, exhausted and abused. What we are is broken, and we share this brokenness together. And together, we point to one shared truth, and that's this. We need saving. We have need of a Savior. We need Jesus. This is why Jesus came, because we could not save ourselves. We could not change our broken nature. We'd rather take our money and run. 
We'd rather save face than admit the truth of our brokenness. We'd rather deny Christ than look bad in front of others. We go through life thinking that we're the, the hero of the story. From the moment we're born, we have this tiny little narcissistic nature inside of us that thinks everything is about us. We grow up seeing through the eyes of the hero. It's us overcoming the challenges. What if we were to adopt a little bit riskier of a perspective, one that might be a little closer to the truth? What if we're actually a villain in the story? What if we're the one who hurts other people? What if we're the abusers and the deceivers, liars, rebels? Could we go there? Could we be that honest? Shusaku Endo wrote this book called Silence, where he talks about in 17th century Japan, under the Tokugawa shogunate, a pair of Jesuit monks who go to Japan to meet with locals there. And it, uh, the story um, that was recently made into a movie by Martin Scorsese uh, talks about Father Rodriguez who has this desire to emulate Christ in the middle of all his suffering. And he goes to Japan, and the Japanese uh, start, they, they torture all the Christians. And he gets captured, and he gets imprisoned. And he keeps think, saying, like, Father, forgive them. They don't know what they do. He's quoting the words of Jesus. I'm going to endure the suffering that Jesus endured. And it gets to the climax of the movie. And... He is brought to a place where his fellow believers are being tortured. And he's told, they are going to be tortured. They're not going to be killed, but they're going to be tortured until you deny Christ. And then he's faced with this unthinkable moral dilemma. Do I renounce Christ and my fellow believers will suffer? Or do I deny Christ and ease their suffering? He wrestles with this decision for a long time. And the whole movie, or the whole book, has been building up to this crazy decision. And the uh, Japanese baron sets down on the ground this image of Christ, cast in bronze. And he says, all you have to do is step on Christ, and your fellow believers will go away. And there's a beautiful moment in the movie where Father Rodriguez looks down at the image of Christ, and he hears in his head the image of Christ speaking back to him. And Christ from the, the bronze says to him, Come ahead now. It's all right. Step on me. Trample. I understand your pain. I was born into this world to share men's pain. I carried the cross for your pain. I came to be trampled upon. Step on me. And Father Rodriguez comes to the understanding that he's not like Jesus. He's like Peter. He's like Judas. He's like us. It's not the healthy people who need a doctor. It is the sick, the broken, the us. Are we honest enough to see our need for saving? Jesus came into the world to heal it to redeem, to make clean, to renew. And somehow in the middle of our mess, in the middle of our brokenness, we encounter this amazing God who loves us despite ourselves, who looks at us with a love that is pure and without condemnation. We encounter a God who will move heaven and earth in order to bring himself, to bring us back to himself. And that is beautiful. So that leads us to next week, which will be the crucifixion. Jesus taking the brokenness, the sinful natures of ourselves upon himself so that we could experience life. Everett, would you close us in prayer? Jesus, we thank you
Thank you for bearing the weight of our sin and our brokenness. That we can't do it on our own. We aren't our own saviors. But you love us so much that you do it for us. Amen. Before you go in the love of Christ. Um, yeah, she didn't see that coming because this wasn't planned. But I just, I don't know, I just felt that after that message and, and you guys, and I know this will make these guys uncomfortable, but it's, well, just hear me out. What Caleb shared at the beginning before his message about where he's at, um, but then the message itself, I just want to take a moment and pray for them, but... I also want to pray for all of you because I know it's on, you know, Caleb's heart. Um, that he's, he's not the only one. Uh, it feels a little bad that he could, you know, go off and do this. But many of you, many of you struggle. There's a lot going on. We're aware of it because we're your pastors and we talk to you and we know and it comes in all these shapes and sizes. Sorry. It comes in all these shapes and sizes. And so I appreciate Caleb leading by example, Caleb and Becky to go and, and do something like this, to admit weakness, brokenness, the need to take care of themselves, but let that be an example to all of you. And, and I want to pray for all of you too, especially those of you who are sitting out there thinking, yeah, I, I'm also broken. Um, um, and, and like he said, come to us, talk to us, talk to somebody, um, do what you need to do, okay, to, to take care of yourself. We are all on a journey. We are broken people, Peter and Judas, broken people in need of a savior so let me take a moment and pray for them and then pray for those of you out there who know who you are who also need that prayer let's pray father god i thank you so much for again your great grace and your love thank you jesus that you knew before time began how we would fail just like you knew Minutes before how Peter would fail you, you knew all of us, what we would do, what kind of disciples that we would be, which is pretty weak ones. And yet you loved us, and while we were yet sinners, you died for us. You came into this world to be trampled upon. You knew it, but you came anyway. Thank you. Father, I lift up. Uh, Caleb and Becky as they take off this afternoon be with them walk with them be with the counselor um, that they're with give wisdom strength guidance God we pray for replenishment we pray for um, insights we pray we pray that you would be there in a special way 
And God, I pray for each person here today who's struggling in some unique way, whether it's trials being thrown upon them or um, their own brokenness from the inside or both. There's just so many different hurts and, and trials and things going on out there. Lord, I pray that you would be with each of your people. Walk with them and let them let others in to their life to walk with them as well. And let that be healing and let that bring grace. Father, give your hope through your son. Strengthen us, we pray, and put praise upon our lips. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. And now, go have a blessed week. God bless you.